Today's episode of Human Factors Cast is brought to you by Audible.com. Go to audibletrial.com slash humanfactorscast to start your free 30-day trial and get a free book. Billy, you like Audible. I love Audible. It's the I best love thing. Audible. Yeah, you know, doing work around the house, driving to work, everything like that. It's you can, great. You can just listen and don't have to, like, pay attention to the book that you're reading. It just happens. Exactly. I love that. Especially in busy lives. You know what? I love sharing my books with you. Because, yes. Because you let me borrow Ready Player One, and it was phenomenal. Yeah? You liked it? Good. Yeah. Good. What are you listening to right now? How Star Wars Conquered the Universe. Ooh, what's that about? It's exactly about what it sounds like. <laughs> anyway, if you guys are listening, go to audibletrial.com slash humanfactorscast to start your free 30-day trial uh, they'll hook you up with thousands of books from a ton of different genres. Audible.com is great. Thanks again for sponsoring this podcast. Today, we're talking about applications. So it's going to be a good one. Stick around. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Here are your hosts, Nick Rome and Billy Hall. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Billy Hall. Hey guys, how's it going today? And returning, like a Jedi, after he's been cut down in two by Darth Vader, it's Mr. Blake Arnsdorf, joining hey. us again for this week's episode. What's going on, everybody? It's good and to be back. And you still have all your arms and legs. Isn't that like a no-no in the Jedi Order? Like, you have to lose an arm and a leg? This is true. A bit of magic, though, and some human factors growth. Dark hell. I will come to the bottom of this yet. I just know it. So, Blake, you're back. You just couldn't get enough of Human Factors cast. No, I couldn't. I listened to last week's episode, and I just had to come back. <sighs> yeah, the board games. Oh, man. We're going to have fun today, right? Billy, what are we talking about today? All right. We're going to be talking about apps and app design, which is probably something that a lot of our listeners are pretty interested in. I would assume so. Yeah, the thing is apps have kind of taken over our entire lives, right? Yeah, I like I can't go insane without my phone. I can't think of a single day when I haven't used an app in, you know, the last... 10 years. Isn't it weird when you actually are on your computer and realize that an app that's on your phone you can't use on your desktop and you're like, why? Yeah, it seems like there's like... a really good point, yeah. Yeah. Like, it's like, these are just great programs to have all the time. Well, I guess the worst thing for me, I don't know about you guys, but I use an Android, but I do everything else on my laptop and it's a Mac, so I really never have anything that's the same. Why can't they just make that divide? I don't know. Yeah. You know, what's interesting to me is when you have... um, it's almost like the opposite of what we just talked about, where you have a desktop version, but you don't have a mobile version. Mm-hmm. It's like, you guys make a lot of money. You could afford to make a mobile version. Why don't you? The, the funny part there, too, is like you can build it now without having to use specific type of like Android code or iOS right. SDK stuff. I mean, there's, stuff. Yeah, there's kits and stuff to like help you build these things. It's yeah. really impressive how free... Building another app. I mean, mind you, it leads to a lot of, like, shovelware out in the world. But anybody can pretty much build an app with just a rudimentary idea of coding. You know, I uh, I listened to another podcast, uh, and, and they were talking about how, like, the quality of games on mobile devices has come down significantly. And this was in response to Mario. Uh, they just announced that Mario is going yeah, yeah, to yeah. be on iOS and Android later next year. Are mm-hmm. you serious? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's sick. I thought he was only going to be on iOS for at first. Exclusively for the first couple of months. Of course, he, yeah. But uh, they were talking about how the quality of games has gone down dramatically since uh, you know, it is so easy to push these things out to the market and people have this expectation on the on the mobile side of things to have it be free and you know because there's a bunch of games that are crap out there and they're free Mm -hmm. it's like that expectation is set low so everyone's speculating on what the prices of this mario game is going to be i'd be really surprised if it's like more than ten dollars i mean you can get most super mario arm stars on your wii for what or on your D- 3DS yeah. or anything like that. And it, you would probably own one of these if you're a Mario fan regardless, you know? 
what yeah. they might do too. I mean, this is happening in Hearthstone for sure. You see, like it's a, it's re- really well built, but a lot of the stuff is in app pay, so you can like play the base stuff. But if you want to keep progressing, you have to pay through it. Well, that's just the CCG model. It seems like that's you know true, what I mean. Yeah. Like Magic does it too. Do we have show notes on in app purchases? Because I feel like that's something that we should cover. Oh, I don't. Well, we'll just kind of <laughs> vamp it. That's right. We're going off the rails. It's mass anarchy here on the Human Factors Gas. But anyway, we're not talking about games. We're talking about apps and app design. Right, right, right. So what is an app? It's probably obvious, but let's define what an app is to get us and the listener on the same page. Right. Well, I think of an app as, as something um, that you use online or on a mobile device that is is built for a specific purpose. Okay. I mean, you know, you have you have the banking app that's meant right. for banking. You right. have, you don't have, it, it's not like a, a web browser where you direct your, uh, your goal. You know, you don't go to a certain web address. It's, it's built for these utilities. Yeah. Right? I mean, I have an app for uh, physical activity, I have, of course, the games on the app. I have apps for Facebook. I have things that I have, a lot of people have RS uh, feeds, you know, like news feeds and things like that on Podcast. There. Podcast addict. Podcast got to be the biggest one I think I use. Yeah, right? Or also, YouTube. Oh, that too. I mean, for like tunes and stuff like Can that. Can you imagine if they actually paid five bucks for the YouTube app? How many people would have, how much money YouTube would just make? Can oh, you imagine yeah. if they started charging for YouTube? Oh, wait. It, it, yep. Don't even knock <laughs> it. It's amazing. YouTube Red is awesome. Oh, for real? Oh, it's the best thing I ever downloaded. Sweet. This episode of Human Factors Cast is brought to you by YouTube Red. <laughs> Please do that. No, I'd love that. They're not actually a that. partner. They're not going to pay us for this. Uh, right. All right. So yeah, yeah, something for a specific purpose. That's. I mean, do you can. Is there anything else that you want to add to that, Blake? Not really. I mean, it, that's you're exactly right. I mean, it's just a piece of software that's meant to do a specific thing. But I guess where we kind of have to think about it is like you usually start with a specific purpose. Like, I don't know, like, let's say Google Drive where it started out with just worksheets. Like, not it didn't have the Excel function or the PowerPoint, but it just builds on it. So sometimes you add more functionality. Multi-purpose you app. Yeah. But I mean, it's still within the same vein of editing documents on the cloud. For sure, right? yeah. I would say that that's Google Apps uh, or Google Drive's uh, sort of, you know, specialty. Yeah. That's, and that's the specialty. I mean, I that, do. Google Maps. I mean, like, Google's really starting to take over on that. I mean, but that's, that's an interesting thing about apps. It's in such our, our common consciousness that we don't really have to, we can't even go into detail that much about it. Because it's so simplistic, but it's one of those things that's like, it'd be describing apples, you know? Yeah, apples. We know apples. For sure. I mean, we've now, or I definitely take for granted actual physical maps, because now it's all become, like, I just Google it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay, so what makes an app good, though? That's the real question. How can you ensure that your app idea will be good? I mean, there's, like I said, anybody can make an app, it seems like. For sure. I mean, like, in some instances, this comes to a little bit like of your preference, right, as your user, what do you like? But, mm-hmm. I mean, like we were talking about earlier, it's got to fulfill some kind of specific purpose. Mm-hmm. You're in there to do something. Right. Um, I, I think it should do exactly that. Like, I mean, I can't remember which episode we talked about, but there's there's an episode where we talked about if I want this app to do something, I the best app, you know, for me um, is, is just a one-button app. Like, Tinder. We did it on our Tinder episode. Was it Tinder? Okay, yeah. that was episode two. All right, yeah. so... Doing callbacks. Go back and listen to that episode. Great episode. Uh, but so so yeah. I mean, to me, it, it you open up the app, you press a button, and whatever that app is for, it's done. Exactly. Like Twitter. If I open up Twitter, it's never going to take me to Facebook. Right. Yeah. I'm thinking like even more simpler. Like Domino's. I want to open that app, press a button, and my pizza's on its way. What? That's a that thing. exists? Yeah. <laughs> We're going to cut this podcast short. Hold on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, I, well, I don't know if it exists on the app, but it does exist. Like, you can order a dash button and program it to do that, like an Amazon dash button. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. One button. You know, they call, those things cost five bucks? What's yeah. that about? Well, hey, they, they cost five bucks, and then the first time you use it, it credits your account for five bucks. 
Oh. So I use it for trash bags. So like I got one for trash bags. So every time I run out of trash bags, I just press the thing. One button. I don't have to order anything. It knows my favorite trash bags. It just shows up at my door. That scares me. That's getting into Skynet territory. That is it's, pretty scary. It's cool. awesome. Yeah, it's no, awesome. I'm sorry. It, you know, it, basically, ultimately, if it can't be that one button press, it's got to come back to good UX. Mm, okay. What is good UX? Uh, good UX. I mean, it might it might be a good idea to go back and talk about what UX is. All right, is. all right, all right, all right, all right. Especially let's, if you're not familiar let's with dial that right? back a little bit there. What is UX? Blake, you do a lot of UX work. I do a little bit of UX work. So UX, short for user experience, right? So this is really looking at like the what, the when, where, how, and how, and who is actually using the application. So it's like from start to finish, how somebody actually gets through an application or a piece of software. Right. And then how satisfied they are with it, being able to get their tasks done or like enjoying themselves. Right, yeah. It's kind of that overall experience that a person sort of uh, feels like while they're using a product Right, like one of these websites, or, you know, it's not just limited to applications. It could be websites, video games, mm-hmm. um, and anything, really. Like, it, it could even go down to how do you feel about using this fan, this, like, floor fan? Is that a good user experience? Yeah, yeah. I turn the knob and I feel good. That's a good experience. Like, huh. it, it can be applied to anything, but most frequently, I would say that it is associated with, like, software design. And in mobile apps, you get like a whole another layer added, right? Because now you're designing for a much smaller screen. You got to think about using specific UI elements for the hand or for the thumb. Yeah, because so, usually you use a good app. You you only need one hand to really use it. This is a family show, Billy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, but you're right. Because like if you're walking down the street. And, you know, you want that one hand to, like, press the cross sign or something while you're on your phone. And it's uncomfortable to text with two hands, so you use swipe. It's like, yeah. Yeah. That is one thing. It's like, it, it's more convenient if you can hold it in one hand and manipulate your phone with one hand. And have the other one free to do miscellaneous items. Like, if you're listening to audiobooks uh, and, and, you know, cleaning around the house, you can use one hand to clean and the other one to control your audible.com <laughs> <laughs> subscription. <laughs> You know, the, the other thing about it is, I wonder about UX. Do you also monitor how long an app is on a phone? Yeah, so, I mean, that's a really Ooh, good point. People yeah. do, like, when they bake in analytics into their applications, they're looking at things like, okay, how many times does somebody open this? How long do they use it for? But I don't know if anybody's really paid attention to how long is, like, version one on their phone. Or when do they take it off their phone? Yeah, but... You know, they, well, sometimes, um, less common with mobile applications, you have, like, exit surveys, right? So they'll they'll say, like, why are you leaving us? Why Why are you... <laughs> I always thought well, they did that leave. just to make me feel bad. Well, <laughs> yeah, they probably do. Why? In a little bit, they probably do, Don't yeah. you Don't so, you love Groupon? <laughs> I mean, they probably Billy do. Group on. But at the same time, <laughs> you know, most most corporations don't really care about you, and they're just looking for the reason why, so they can fix that. And you know what? I'm not going down your dark and lonely road. You can't make me walk from the light of corporate America. You can't do it, you devil worship being are you human Billy factor jo- designers. Are you Billy Joel? Are you like is this Green Day right now? <laughs> like, all right. All right. So. Like we said, there are ways that companies and individuals can improve app design to help them build a great UX. Like, what are those steps, though? So, really, you're looking at trying to clearly define what the goals of your application are. Mm -hmm. Like, looking at what else is out there, what things are they're lacking in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, once you've kind of defined, like, okay, I want my app to do X, Y, or Z, you really go out and you look at a target audience. Mm. So you're looking for people that are actually going to use this app. So you're looking for like things they already use that you can try and bake in like either interactions or UI elements that they're familiar with. So when they use their your app, like uh, I use a Pomodoro timer and that's like, that's something I look for or some features that I look for in that are like when you turn it on, it blocks everything out. Okay. So like, for example, like we were talking about the Domino's app. They have they do have a button where you can put in your normal order, push one button and go. You would look for things like that. Yeah, you like want... how many times does this guy actually like the meat lovers pizza? Oh yeah, that's actually really that's interesting. Well, you know, a lot of these points go back to our design episode, right? Like we right. we talked a lot about you know knowing what your goal of the application is to do, like what like what 
what it is that this app does. Also, you know, we also talked about designing it for the target user that you thought about. Your that, target audience. And I mean, that, that to me, at least, is everything. Because if you don't design for the intended user, it's not going to be a good user experience. It's not going to be a good UX, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? And, I mean, yeah, knowing your demographics is key. Okay. So, let's say we know what we want to do with our app and have a pretty good idea of the target audience. What do app makers need to know to design a great app? That seems really nebulous, though, right? But what kind of key functions or key ideas should you go into if you want to make your first app? Right. Well, I mean, go listen to our design episode because a lot of those principles can be applied here. Like, you know, the one thing... It, it all comes back to that experience that we were just talking about. You know, mm-hmm. like, is it going to be an enjoyable experience for your user? And then in order to do that, they, they just have to go through those steps, right? You know, like like all the design steps. Just do it. And, and that's it. <laughs> so something that does get introduced that's a little tougher for people out there is, like, especially if you're in the world of, like, commercial design, right? So you have to be making sure you're following like best practices and design patterns but not only that they have to be up to date so yeah so standards right that's that's consistency and standards that's the standards part of it they gotta know what the hip kids are doing nowadays with their things for sure yeah okay and then also if they use different controls right like you you want that experience to be the same if you if you swipe left you want it to open up a menu or something. If you, you know, if you swipe down, you want it to do the, you know, open up the menu on mm-hmm. the top. Mm-hmm. You want these things to be consistent across the apps. Hey, you don't want to introduce something brand new and foreign, or else it's just going to confuse a lot of people. That's interesting because, like Apple phones and Android phones, especially the hardware can be very different from one to another. Like if someone only uses Apple phones, you hand them an Android phone, there's that little learning curve of what's going on. But apps are always the same on these things, it seems like. Yeah, but I found that navigating these apps is more difficult when you go to the other system. For me, it's like, or maybe maybe it's one way versus the other. I have an Android, but whenever I try to use an iPhone, mm-hmm. I'm always sitting there going, oh, how do I go back? Because the Android has those physical back, back buttons. buttons. That's true, yeah. yeah. And it's like in, in Apple, I think it's like a backwards arrow at the top normally or something something like that. And, and you know, normally what I end up doing is like going back to the home screen and going through all the button presses to get back to where I was, but just alter that last decision to make it what I actually intended it to be. Okay. All right, so there are there are, uh, there are many kinds of common strategies that companies use in app design, and as human factor wizards like you two are, what kind of general design strategies can you use? Go back and listen to the design. <laughs> wow, lots of callbacks <laughs> to the design episode, right? Yeah, now. right. Any of those, any of those from see, we're building on other topics. That shows that we're consistent. You know, even from the conception to user testing to prototyping to all these things, these uh, these steps are going to make sure that you design the best app. Mm. But beyond that, I mean, we can talk about things like UI design, um, and and we've already kind of touched on mobile apps, but they require different they they have different requirements than website applications do. Right, right, right. I mean, that's why they always have the desktop version and mobile version. But funny enough, they don't have it the other way around when you're on the desktop. What do you mean? Well, like, for example, if I visit a website, it always gives me the mobile version of the website. On your phone? on, On my phone. But if I'm on my desktop, it gives me... It doesn't give me an option to go to the mobile version on my... On my, uh... Normally, it's just typing an M before... In place of the www. Just blew my mind. Well, now, too, it's gotten a little, even a little bit different with, like, responsive design, right? Because oh, now, yeah. as you're changing viewports, it's just making decisions for you. It's like, okay, I know he's on a phone. I know he's on a web browser, so it'll just shrink and change content based off of that. Is that kind of like the idea when we talked about an automation about Skynet and things, AI and stuff like that? No. It, it It's literally <laughs> just coding behind the scenes where they Dang say... It. Depending on how big your browser window is, that's what I'm going to show. I'm going to show you varying levels of content. So, next time you're on your computer, mm-hmm. uh, you know, cl- uh, sort of minimize your 
web browser horizontally and you'll watch as the the layout will change you know the top menu bar will go from a menu bar to typically a bar with a hamburger button on it that you press to access that's what it's called Really? It's called a hamburger it's called button? A hamburger, hamburger button. menu. Oh, yeah. And Secret there's, sauce. There's, well, I mean, the hamburger button is interesting, too, because, like, it's it's just come around in the last couple of years, and it's it's making, it's it's make, made great waves in, like, the way that we interact. Can you imagine? I can just imagine you guys sitting around on the menu. I was like, how can we make the hamburger button better? Are we really using that term, hamburger button? Yes. You know, we were going to go with the hot dog button, that, but that was too suggestive. But, I mean, you here's the thing, though, Billy, is you know exactly what that was just by us saying hamburger button. <laughs> That's true. You're right. I did. I really did know that. And you know nothing about, well, I can't say that anymore because you, you have gradually learned more I'm, and more about... I, my master's degree is in the mail. I'm writing a book right it's now. It's on its way. Honorary yeah. master's. <laughs> Honorary master's degree. I was going to go for a doctorate, but I didn't want to get too preachy. But yeah, well, let's let's go into you. Let's go into UI design a little bit because we're sure. we're talking about you know strategies, right? And we've already said go to design, right? Let's let's talk about UI design, um, and and that UI is short for user interface. Yeah, so I mean, this brings a lot of challenges for your developers, right? So you have to pick a specific platform and adapt to that as it goes. So if you have a if you're building a brand new app, you might be a little bit better off. But if you're going for like a version two or three, you may be updating a lot of software code, which will ultimately influence your UI design. But like, if we're just talking about like, what's the front end look Wait, like? Wait, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go back to that one real quick. Sure. So the idea of it is, is that it's been different based on the idea that you're building something brand new versus updating another version that already exists? Yeah, it could be easier or harder, right? Because if you're starting from scratch, you know what the most current platform is, mm-hmm. what version's out there. So it lets you, you, know, like, you know what to design. You for. mean version like what software is on your phone? Yeah, so for like, I think, I don't know whether you call it for iOS, but like for Dro- Droid, I think it's like Marshmallow, right? Right, right, well, right. The Operating next, system, uh, iOS, yeah. There you go. Uh, well, within the next drop, a lot of the designs that are currently out there are going to have to be updated because they're adding extra UI features, changing UI kits, that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, changing the style guide behind everything, saying this has to be this big for the people to touch or this small. For, or, th- or sorry, this big for people to read. It can't be. It has to be within all these certain parameters. Okay. Uh, so if I was making an app called Billy's Fantastic Hamburger Button, does all these things that it can do, and I was making it for Marshmallow, and all of a sudden the new Android operating system, I don't know, uh, double Marshmallow, double Marshmallow across the sky, or double Rainbow, double Rainbow comes out. It has to. It be might dessert. actually be. Oh yeah, it has to, it has be, to dessert. be dessert themed. So fla- um um um. um Cream Puff comes out. Cream Puff. Cream Puff comes out. It might be harder to design based on how Cream Puff interacts with phone. I would love to see it. While if you were making Billy's Magical Hamburger Button uh, app in Cream Puff, it would be easier to make it because even though you're starting from the ground up, yeah, because now you're having to go backwards, right? If you have something that exists, you've already got like a stable environment mm-hmm. for people that are using it, you're now having to change maybe perhaps interactions or UI mm-hmm. elements like buttons. Because you have an established audience. Exactly. And, ah. and some of it some of it comes back to like politics in the workplace, right? So so a lot of times if if there is like a new framework or a new um, operating system update, they'll say, oh, okay, a... Um, a less number of people can accomplish this task because it's just updating, right? When really it's almost like rebuilding the entire app, and they need more more uh, uh-huh. manpower. Right. So, so having them, uh, you know, having to do this all by themselves can be a challenge too, and that's that's true in some. Workplaces. So that's based on the idea of workplace and workload. And I doubt most app designers get the idea that get the news ahead of time that a new update for they're they're pretty informed yeah they're okay. pretty plugged in right because you don't you even if like you're let's say you're google and you're releasing a new ui kit or whatever you're gonna want to like keep plugged into at least your company and other companies because you don't want them to like well, be uncompetitive yeah and and google doesn't want other companies to fail by not adhering to the design standard they put out this standard to make it to make the experience on their operating system, we're coming back to that user experience. They want that user experience of that operating system to be consistent across all the apps, as long as they follow this this design uh, 
recommendations, these design recommendations. And kind of like hinting or going back to like them releasing a design standard, something about that is often like the use of color. And I mean, that's that's a big part in how applications like attract people, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, color is interesting. I haven't really done a whole lot of uh, studies on color and how it affects, um, you know, how how somebody feels about a product, uh, you know, aside from branding colors. Branding color colors are pretty big. Um, just because, you know, when you, when you brand a product, it's usually associated with a color. And when you use that app, you want to see that color to know that, you know, A, it's legitimate and B, it just gives you that reassurance that you're using that, that company, that, that company's product. Like the color red used in a lot of, in a lot of apps. Like for example, YouTube uses the color red. Chrome, one of the most uh, noticeable colors, the color that's at top of the Chrome thing is red. You know, Yellow, red, red and, and blue. Well, I meant like, but on the top of it, you know, the, if you're looking at your phone, first color you see is red. It draws your eye to it. Am I the only one that thinks the chrome thing looks like Simon? No. No, you're definitely not. You're definitely not. But I just want to point out here that, you know, Billy's fantastic hamburger button 2017. Find <laughs> it right now on Patreon. <laughs> I mean, yeah, colors colors are interesting. I wish, I, I, I should look into that a little bit more. Because colors, colors are really interesting. They can evoke moods, especially like when you think about, like, it would be interesting to see the correlation between that. Like, for example, Facebook's been blue forever. So is Twitter. Like, I, I'm wondering if it's a social media thing to go blue because you have Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting. Some. No, is Dig blue? I think LinkedIn. Dig's like... LinkedIn is LinkedIn blue. Is, LinkedIn is, is yeah. blue. But it's, it's funny because you, like, relate those distinct blues. Like, I, guess, I know, well, like, yeah. Twitter from yeah. Facebook. Doesn't even Kick have a blue dot over the eye? I'm not sure. It, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But, yeah, it's, it'd be interesting. I would never use Kick. I love you, Kia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Says the guy who tried out Tinder in our second episode. That's just because you wouldn't. <laughs> Uh, next point that we have here is hacking psychology. So we kind of talk, talked about and touched on color a little bit. Uh -huh. uh, but one one thing that I, Nick I, Nick and Billy, but Nick, for sure, I want to get your opinion on like minimal UI design and applications. Yeah. Because there, there are some that are so Acknowledge me, but just sweep me right out of the way. No, because I know you'll have an <laughs> opinion, but I would like to see what his like human factors take on it is. Um, oh, it's really interesting. Um, because... You, you have to strike this balance between clutter on the screen and explaining to the user what things do, right? And, and oftentimes there's a lot of sort of difficulty in displaying information and it comes back to that clutter, right? Like how can we declutter the screen enough to make it look good, right? We're talking about UI design, user interface design. So how, how can it look good be functional uh, and and still provide enough content to allow the user to interact with it in a meaningful way. Um, well, isn't there just some universal truths in 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 apps though? Yeah, it depends. That's the universal truth. No, no, I meant like in certain apps. There's well, it's true. It always depends. But in certain apps, I'm sorry, I, I'm not looking at my phone. I'm just get off phone your for phone. Run. We're I'm recording a podcast. Run. I know. But, like, there's certain truths in certain apps. Like, if I go to Facebook right now, I look at it, I have a search bar at the top. Normally, in at least Android phones, there's always a search bar at the top, so I know that it's there. Consistency I, and standards. I have I have the home screen button, and then I have the, the events button. Yeah, so it's like a standard navigation, usually, yeah. And then if I go over to Twitter... I go over, I have a home button. I have a notification button, too. Consistency and standards. Here's the thing. If you're listening to this podcast and making an app, look at what other apps are doing. That's a huge, like, it's going to get you a long way. Uh, you know, it don't, don't try to recreate the wheel because it won't work out for your users. They'll get confused. And although it might feel like you're copying, make it unique, but still make it consistent and, you know... At least in a way that they're going to be familiar with, or else your app is going to be doomed. I mean, that's a two-tiered approach, right? Because you want to look at applications that hopefully your target users are already using, but also you want to be consistent with what like Facebook and Twitter are doing in some instances with the navigation, because then it's just going to make it super simple for anybody to pick it up, even if it's a brand new like user that's outside of your target audience. Now, right, Blake, Blake. You asked me about minimal UI design. 
And I want to bring up the point of mobile apps. So with mobile apps, it's almost more difficult. So I was talking about clutter on the screen. But with mobile apps, it has to be like super minimal, right? You have to have everything that this user can do on such a small screen, right? The icons have to be big enough for them to touch, yet small enough to not clutter the screen. That's a unique challenge and, you know, one that a lot of people face. And it's... The only advice I can offer is, like, seriously sit down and think about your information architecture and interaction design within the app to optimize those things. Yeah, I mean, information architecture is going to be a big deal, but it's it's kind of funny. This is why I wanted to see what you would say about minimal UI design was, like, when I think about minimal UI design, I guess, like, there's, all, there's the user-facing component, of course, but I always think of, like, having less features. But there are some apps, like Evernote, that pulls off a lot of really good, complex stuff in a small little space. Right. Well, it comes back to that hamburger button, man. Yeah, I know. No, Saving that's, lives left and right. Well, see, seriously, here's the trend. It's like, it's like, yeah, we have so many things to display. Well, why don't we just put it off screen in a little button? Well, like, I mean, like, we've, we, we, we've seen apps like that before. I mean, like, back in the day where Facebook was a thing and everything like that. And, like, back when we had AOL Messenger, they made apps that you could actually put all of your messenger services in one place and things like that. But, I mean, we're talking about minimalist UI design. Can you give me, I mean, let's break it down to examples. Can you give me examples of minimalist UI design? The Domino's app that we talked about earlier. I, God, I really got to check to see if this is a real thing. But you go go to the app and it's like Let's order my pizza. To download it. Sorry. I mean, like what? <laughs> <laughs> right. You're gonna order a pizza after this. No, but um, this episode of Human Factors Cast is brought to you by Domino's. Oh God, please, yes. I'm a fat kid in love. Oh man. <laughs> Cream puff is what we call you guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. Bringing it back. <laughs> no, but but any app that highlights its main feature on you know, as one thing, like do this, get this. I, that that's what it is to me. Like, what about you, Blake? What do you think? I mean, when I think of super minimalist, I mean, I know it's got a lot of com like complexity in what it'll show you. But Amazon is the biggest one for me, especially their mobile app service now. Because it's like you can add something to your cart and you can even one-click buy it. So that's literally, I don't know, perhaps three things. Go query something, put it in your cart, and then you one-click buy One-click buy. Yeah, no, that, that, yeah, that's a great example of minimalist. Like, if you can't do the one-button thing, make it easily accessible for somebody to do. What about Messenger? Messenger seems like a very one-click, you know. Um, you open Facebook the app. app and, I mean, it's the idea that you don't have to input usernames. Get off your phone. I'm doing this because I, for focus of thought, like, what you're trying to say is, like, for example, I can even connect my uh, contacts to this. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a whole different subject, right? Because now it's integrating with your with everything on your phone. Yeah. Is that also considered a minimalist idea when it takes the job of another app? Not in the sense that we're talking about, but that does... Oh, we got to do, like, interoperability and integration. That'd be a great... And voodoo. Because <laughs> yeah, integration's a big one, especially now. Because every app you download, I, I swear it asks you, can I have all of your contact information? Can I, <laughs> I think that's a requirement, this actually. Anything off of Google yeah. Play. This, this app will request your social security number, your date of birth, and... Your hair and eye color. It better come with Google Glass then. <laughs> it asks you to steal your identity politely. <laughs> oh man! But yeah. yeah, no, I am. Are there any more important points about app design? Yeah, I, well, onboarding. I would think. Yeah, onboarding. So mobile onboarding is a big topic nowadays. So. Like, Billy, do you know what mobile, mobile onboarding no, is? No, 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 no. What well, is on, mobile onboarding? On, onboarding just in general, right? That's that's getting people on board with your app. It, it's literally like it sounds. So like That really sounds just like fancy talk for getting people on board with your app. You know, like breaking it down to like two word sentences like you're in the 80s. Kind of. Are you cool? I'm cool. <laughs> yeah, so so onboarding is, is yeah, getting getting people 
to use your app. Okay. Like, it's it's kind of like podcasting. You want people to listen to your podcast. That's called onboarding. Have you heard my voice? I don't want anyone to listen to this. <laughs> If you're listening to this, send Billy an email letting him at uh, humanfactorscast at gmail.com, letting him know that you're listening to him now. It'll make him really <laughs> nervous for next to week's him show. Right now. <laughs> I know one person is. <laughs> no, but it, it, it's the same thing, right? Like getting uh-huh. people to do something that you want them to do. Right. Use your app. Get them to buy a product on an e commerce site. Get them to listen to a podcast. Mm-hmm. See the advertisements you get. All these things go into play with it. And it's a really big deal because you want to make a good first impression on people when they like they spend the time to go ahead and download your app and they open up for the first time. You want to demonstrate some value for them. Mm. Like, why did they go ahead and take up the space on their phone and put this thing on? Because you're one app of many, many different apps. Like, like a date. Oh, yeah. It's like you 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 want to show your worth on the first date to get to that second date because because <laughs> what happens on the third date? This is a family show. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but gradually you work up. You know, it, you show what you need to show to get to that next step. And mobile onboarding is just like that. You show them what they need to see in that first step. And first impressions are super important. Mm-hmm. So you know what they see with your app that will pretty much drive whether or not they come back to it again right right okay so i mean even though the user experience is crucially important to the idea of the first like what what would you say minute first two minutes because it's an app man it might be the first like few seconds i mean because you immediately want to demonstrate to them what they can do with the app i forget the statistic but you make a first opinion about something in like less than three seconds or something like mobile apps right no anything you make a first like Impression about anything in less than three seconds. It's it's some ridiculously short number. I'd have to double check. So don't hold me to it. But but it is really short. So so no matter if it's a mobile app or another person, you're making that first impression in a couple seconds. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. So these are all great goals. But how the heck do you ensure people will hop on board with this app training, you know? How pe- how do you think people will actually get on board with this thing? You, you know, I you, mean, like you said, with the idea of dating and things like that, but what can you use? Can you use big tools? Here's five bucks. That's, that's actually a really good strategy, um, is using monetary incentives to drive people back, right? You, you uh, that's, that's one way to do it, right? You say, okay, if you get a friend to sign up, we'll give you $5 towards your next purchase. We'll give you $5 in credit towards whatever this app has to offer, right? And and that that's definitely one way of doing it. Yeah, we did that the other day, games. right? I mean, you sent me the invite code to use Digit. Yeah, yeah. Still haven't gotten my $5. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to these guys. These pe- two people are scientists here participating in a mobile web pyramid schemes what's that all about it's not a pyramid scheme if you're just trying to get more users right is, is it the idea of generating <laughs> user goals though i feel like that's exactly is that the, that is wait, wait, wait. Yeah. if it's like dating is this the equivalent of she has a really great personality <laughs> so one thing that's also important is like progressive onboarding because we talked a little bit earlier about some applications have like a complex workflow like you have a lot of functionality within them um, and so you kind of just use this gesture-driven onboarding process, where as you walk through a brand new app, it shows you around a little bit, gives you a bit of a tour. It's basically a tutorial. Mm-hmm. It's, okay. It's basically saying, hey, to do this, you know, tap this hamburger button in the top left, it'll drop down a menu, then press this one, and then deposit all your money to us, and, and we'll make tons of money off of you. <laughs> so I mean, like, I, it makes perfect sense because I, I remember every time when you put an app in uh, for the first time when you use it, it'll show you a little speech bubble like this is where you do this, this is where you click on that, and it takes you here, and this is where these do these things, and uh, they do that with Twitter and stuff like that. Right. Go here to post a picture. Go here to do this. It's little speech bubbles that take away. Yeah, Twitter and YouTube have done an awesome job every time they make like a big batch update of mm-hmm. like throwing those tutorials in there, and you can skip hey, those yeah. and drive you nuts or whatever. Yeah, this is new. This is new. And as you were talking about that, it reminded me of another one. Uh, 
when, you know, after you've used these apps, they'll send you push notifications on your phone and say, like, hey, uh, <laughs> you haven't used me in, like, a couple days. Check out this new feature or check out, you know, the, something you might like. If, if they're Google, they have all your info, so they'll be like, oh, check out this YouTube video. Now, is that, is that, um... Is that in the app, or is that someone, oh, back in YouTube, who was like, let's send this little notification to all the people who, you know, yeah. haven't been using the app in a while? Is that built into the app already? Yeah. If it's I, like I haven't been using the app type thing, that's definitely it built could be. in there, yeah. right? Like, mm-hmm. you're going get to get something sent to you, like, oh, I miss you, come back, that type of stuff. If it's a new feature, it's likely that they pushed it out with the feature, mm. and then it just kind of shows up after a predetermined amount of time. Okay, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so personalizing over customization, though. Like, I, I see a lot of these modular types of apps. Like, what do you use more often? What do you like to use more often? How's that work? So, it's really cool with personalization with mobile apps, right? Because they're, like we talked about a little bit earlier, I think. Like, when you get another app from Google, it asks you, can I have X, Y, and Z information? Can I collect some data on you? So, based off of that data, it'll try and make suggestions about things you like. Like, Spotify does that all the time. They always send me... Um, different uh, artists I might like or anything based off of like my different playlists things like that whereas when you're talking about customization that's like actually making changes on your own okay I mean like I I hate to keep going back to YouTube but they do the same thing with uh, videos and things like that you might you watch this you might like that right for sure yeah 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 and yeah the more data they collect on you it's going to be it's interesting so the more data they collect on you, obviously, the more they know about you. And privacy is a is its whole topic on its own, and we should definitely do a show on it. But, you know, with that loss of privacy, if that's important to you, you do gain, you know, uh, there are benefits to it, right? Like like you said, this, this can streamline processes. It can recommend things that you would like to see. It can... Um, show you ads that, and this is dangerous too. It, you know, we should do the UX of targeted ads because that would be <laughs> that'd be interesting. That'd be so we kind of, did kind of glance over it a little bit when we did our episode on manipulation. A little bit, yeah. I, I feel like targeted ads could be a whole episode. Though. But I mean, like it's a fine line we walk there in the idea of privacy because let's save it for the privacy. No, no, I mean like <laughs> because it's a little bit different than what they're doing. They're, I mean, like, they're getting to know you. It's not like they know that, you know, when you were four, you wet the bed because you were scared of cats. Unless Facebook shares that with them. And then you start getting, you know, gradual advertisements towards... Adult diapers. Adult diapers and, yeah. <laughs> Cat repellent. See? It, yeah, Facebook's probably the scariest of all. But let's save that for okay, okay, our privacy okay. episode. But we're talking about... But the idea of personalizing the app is yeah. uh, the idea that it looks at your preferences, it looks at the things you like to look at, it looks at your subscriptions or, or what you tweet about or what you hashtag, and it Who brings on things you would like. It, and if you talk to one person a lot, it'll say, hey, this person just updated this thing. Why don't you talk to them and tell them how great that is? Or stuff like that, especially on Twitter, you know? Facilitates oh, yeah. social interaction. It yeah. does. And that's actually kind of cool because I've like I've used Twitter only like in the past couple of years, but like every time you I don't know follow somebody new, they'll like suggest people based off of that yeah. later on. It's really yeah. cool. Yeah, it's, it's gotten to the point that I've actually gone down a sub train just because it's like I subscribe to this person. Well, do you also like this person? Yeah, and I was like, how did I go from like William Shatner to Grant Morrison? How did I? Where did I? Where's that logic train go? <laughs> How do these people link together? Six Kevin Bacon. That's the answer. Kevin, Kevin Bacon. Bacon. All right. So we put in the notes here. One word I don't get is gesturization. Like I understand that you know we swipe and we tap and we type, or you know we throw our hands up in the air when a song's really good because you know the flashlight app. But those are the only gestures I know. To be using a phone, like, how does this go into making a so, phone? So, Blake, you put this in here, and it looks like you put special emphasis on it. Do you go? Do you want to talk about this a little bit? Yes. Yeah, so, it's really interesting when you think about, like, the gesturization in phones. So, what does that even mean? You're mm-hmm. adding these specific movements in your hands to make an action happen. And a lot of times we link this to something psychological that we already know. Like, swiping is kind of like you're just moving things away. It's it, turning the page. I, yeah, like, Google's Google's whole philosophy is that with their material design, it's like you're literally moving materials on a, on a table, right? You move this paper left by pushing it left, right? 
Mm-hmm. You move the paper right by pushing it right. You, um, oh jeez, when you when you there when you stack cards, you can actually see the shadow above the other one. No, but that's a design we've had since Windows, isn't it? Kind of, but there's there's just more focused on how it would look in the real world. Windows is more of like an analogous interface where it sort of has those ideas like. You organize files in folders. That's kind of your mental model, right? You you make this thing, and then you store it in a folder. And desktop is not really a desktop, but it's representative of. Okay, I get what you're saying there. Whereas material design is like, how do things move, right? It, it's talking about, like, if I move this paper left, it's got to look like paper moving left. It's got to look like it's stacked on other papers. It's bringing that... Um, visual realism as close as it can get to what well, brings like your real world mental models back now because yeah. now you're taking these physical objects and you're representing it in a digital world right yeah no it's it's interesting one of the things sure. you put in here is like a full hand swipe on droid to take a screen does that work yeah oh yeah, yeah. that's how you just okay so billy right now has pulled out his phone again get off phone. your phone run no, no, i want to know what did, how how does it like what like if i okay take take the side of your hand like this and uh-huh. just wipe over the screen uh it just does this it brings up now okay you did it stuff. i did it wrong you okay did it wrong. so i've it, never even heard it's a of little this. funky yeah hold on a minute let's go into something i'm going into facebook now we're trying it off of facebook uh, okay, so Can bam. Can do it, ladies and gentlemen? Eh. Gotta do it a little bit faster than that. See, I don't even understand some of these ge- gestures that people do. Yeah, yeah see, so... that's an interesting one, right? Let's see if Nick can make it happen. He's trying it on Billy's phone. Oh, man, your phone is just so large. I don't even know. That's what she said. Ooh. No, family show. Family show. All right. No, I can't get it to work either. Maybe maybe you have it disabled or something. I, I mean, like... User error. So, I mean, sure. like, there, there are certain gestures that we don't even know of things that do it. Like, I found out a while ago that uh, if I double tap on my home button, it'll actually clear all my programs. I didn't know that. Like, or, it's just I did it by accident. Well, that's, that's programmable, too. Like, if I double tap on mine, it opens the camera. Because I want to have it... Really? Quickly, yeah. I want to have it quickly mm-hmm. accessed. So that comes back to the whole modular thing. Customization. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, like, there's a lot of swipes that we do it, but no one actually ever teaches us these things, but you make alle- uh, you make, you make comparisons to it in real-world events. Yeah. Okay, yeah. okay, this makes sense. This makes sense. So this is where it's, like, really important, too, to, re- to know your audience and what they're used to using. Because, like, for you, we've ne- you've never heard of doing that full hand swipe. Well, I remember mm-hmm. when I got a Samsung, I hadn't either. I had to look it up on the internet to figure out because I was used to an iPhone where it was, like, a right. two-button press type thing. Yeah, yeah well, I still do the two-button press. I hate the swipe. It's not... it's not intuitive. That's I mean, that's what it comes down to. You didn't even know about it. I hate doing it. Like... Yeah. I mean, I don't even... I, I understand why it's a feature, but I don't... Anyway. I would like it because it's a one-hand thing. I don't have to do anything with two hands. Well, I... You have to hold the phone in yeah, one hand and exactly. swipe with the other. Exactly. How is this that's, Okay, hands? there you go. That's yeah. that's true. <laughs> All right, Billy, what's next? All right, so if you could provide advice to anyone out there wanting to build an app, what would it be? Send it into our show so that we can review it. That's good advice. Um, also visit our design episode and listen to that while you're building your app. Mm -hmm. Uh, Blake, what do you got? So a big thing is like measuring your mobile experience. So like the the big deal is just to try and get the mobile app out there with so much content being flooded in the market. There's there's a great site that I want to plug. They're not sponsoring this or anything, but I've used them a lot in the past. It's called Measuring You dot com i think it's dot com like y-o-u or just the letter u it's it's like the mu but it's like the mu symbol oh, oh wow. okay wow it's but it it's actually just measuring you 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 the, the, the letter, letter u. not yeah. y-o-u not, not y-o-u yeah. measuring you podcast you it's, gotta remember this yes i know and it's short <laughs> for usability measuring you mm-hmm. dot com org it's something like that but they're it's great they have a ton of different uh, ways to measure user data, um, uh, as well as some scales 
to use during your usability testing, finding out, you know, metrics associated with your app. It's it's a great resource, and I still use it every day. You know, one of the things I looked at when I was looking through this stuff and the show notes for it, though, is one point that you guys did make that you haven't touched on yet. And I think it is actually the most important thing for anything, whether you're doing a podcast or anything, is just do it. Just stumble in and just do it. I mean, you have the tools, you have the talent, you have a Google search away to just do it. Oh, man, I wish I had my Shia LaBeouf soundbite right now. Just do it! Come oh, on, Blake, man. you try. Just do it! Okay, here's my attempt. All right. Just do it! Yeah! Yeah! I mean, just I'm, do it! I mean, we've said the same thing. The idea of, like, building a podcast, if you want to mail a YouTube star, if you want to start your own trip, uh, Twitch stream, you get better with time. You know? Yeah, you just well, have to get started, right? You gotta get started, and there's a lot of tools out there. Like, you were just saying, yeah. measure you. Measuring you, yeah. yeah. Uh, what else? So, I mean, what? there's a bunch of different products you can use out there, but, like, really the biggest thing I would say is just look for some hard numbers. Like, look at your conversion rates, bake that into your... Conversion rates, what do you mean? Uh, so, when people actually, like go to your app or start using it or you have a feature where you're trying to get people to actually do something like it's, you want them to buy something from your website. It's uh-huh. the same thing like any retail store would have. Conversion is the amount of customers that come into your store and buy something versus the amount of customers that come into your store and don't buy something. Okay. Right? So if you have a conversion rate of 30%, that means or 33%, that means one in three people who walk into your store buy something. Now, I, I want to know actually something from you guys, especially since, like I said, anybody can app design nowadays. Like, if you had to go and learn more about app design, if you, there was a book or, 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 or a man to look or read about or look up videos about, who would you suggest it would be about app design? Like, who's the, who's the rock stars of app design out in the world? Or UX for apps? That's a good question so there's a lot of like and this is just like a series of books but it's like the o'reilly books and there's one called ux strategy there's also a one about how to make america better again okay let's (laughs) oh that's the o'reilly factor right Uh, there we go o'reilly huh what's his first name um no that's just like a series i think the actual author is jamie levy okay so it's the o'reilly books by jamie levy do you know if this one's available on audible.com it is, actually. Is it? It is. Yeah. It? yeah. yeah. I did a free right. trial because I didn't want to buy it. So, no, but, but it's, uh, it like goes through not just UX design in general, but how you build a actual business model around it and how you can kind of market not your app as well as kind of get into building it. Okay. See, that's, that's that was, important to know. That was a great question, Billy. Thank you. But uh, I think we got to move on. Um, all right. All we've, right. We've talked a lot. Uh, we got We got to move it on. So, we still have a Patreon, a Facebook, a YouTube. We have a lot of ways for us to contact it. So if you want more questions, you can always pick our brains about speaking it. Speaking of questions, this is the part of the show where we hear from you guys, our listeners, with your all your questions. Billy, what do we have today? Our question today comes from Christina Halsey. Christina writes, hey Halsey, guys, Hal- is it Halsey? I'm Probably. sorry. You're butchering everybody's Halsey. name. Halsey. What? Uh, one time? Christina... <laughs> Halsey. Christina writes, Hey guys, I was wondering, as podcasters, what are your favorite podcast-related websites and apps, and why are they your favorite? That's that's a really good question. And uh, this, actually, just to let you guys know, our listeners, this is actually sometimes where we stem our ideas from. So Christina sent in this question, and we thought, oh, that'd be a great topic. Let's talk about apps. Mm-hmm. Um so, so yeah, what, what do you guys do for podcasting? Well, I always thought that um, iTunes was always a great place because the reviews are so great because everybody has an Apple device to do reviews on. But lately I've been using uh, Podcast Addicts. I really like Podcast Addicts. I do too. It's, it, I love the design of the app. I love how easy it is for usability. You know, I think it's just a very good streamlined app See, for it I, all. I don't know. Okay. So I have some usability issues with Podcast Addict. Do you? Oh, I... For sure. I have a ton of usability issues. Maybe, maybe it's because you guys are connoisseurs, you know? Like, we, we have I a, love box wine, but you're like, I only drink vintage 68. Well, no, that being said, I still use it. 
because of the utility, right? Like right. it it deletes my podcasts after I listen to them. Mm-hmm. It auto plays them in a predetermined order. If something else comes in, it elevates it to the top and plays that. Like I can do. There's a lot of flexibility with it. Like I I commute two hours a day, mm-hmm. and so you know when you're not listening to Audible. When I'm not listening to Audible, yeah, no, but. But I, I do commute two hours a day, and so it's important to me to play the things that I want to play next in queue without having to look at my phone and distract myself while driving. So it's more for the utility. Mm-hmm. There's a ton of usability issues that I have problems with it, but... Maybe we can do a review about it. Ah, it's been a while shoot. since we've dusted off that review. Impressions. Missed opportunity there. Blake, what do you use for podcasts? So I was using Stitcher for a long time, but I moved Stitcher, to Podcast okay. Addict. I never used Stitcher. I thought I, I thought it was really good, but for Android, it started crashing a lot, and I got really mm. like out with it. And the thing I think that's like not necessarily bad, but needs some work across like podcast applications is just they hide the search function. It, oh, do they? It's yeah. just always a little too buried for my liking because a lot of times I'm looking for something new or whatever. You know what? That's one thing the podcast addict does do well. There's a plus button right on the main screen. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. A, it's not. I wish it was a search. Yeah, I wish it was the search icon. Yeah, it's. it's that's it's one funny. of those usability issues. You know, I sure. tell you right now. You know what? The podcast app I would really like to see though, like a Pandora version of podcasts. You can listen to the first fifteen to twenty minutes of a podcast. You know, and then skip it, and then skip it if you don't like it. If you yeah. do, you can go back to episodes, and they'll only do like the first, last, like three episodes or stuff like that. You know, and then you could go back and listen to because there's a lot of great podcasts out there, like us, that may fall through the wayside, unlike us because we try hard. Uh, you know, things like that. You know, and you could find new podcasts. You could even find things about interest you didn't even know you liked. Something and. They're not affiliated with you guys' show, but something I would throw out there for other people to think about if they're starting a podcast is we have web like related websites in this question, and like Squarespace has done a really good job with some people's podcasts. Like, really, like Joe Rogan Experience is one of the biggest ones where it's got a video element to it as mm-hmm. well as just the audio and just the the seamless ability to find exactly what you need in the. Kevin Pereira uses Squarespace too for his podcast. Yeah, so that's that's a really great website version of podcasting, especially again, if you've got a video component. Uh, we, yeah, we have to be clear though; we are not sponsored by Squarespace at this time. If and, they want to, though. And, yeah, well, I mean, we're still endorsing it, but it's not because of an advertisement. You should take that endorsement as the fact that we're endorsing it, even though we're not getting paid by endorsing it. I, yeah, I guess that's that's a really good way to look at it. Got him. Got him. All right, em. guys. Um, that's going to be it for today. I do have some exciting news regarding next week. We're going to try a remote podcast for the first time. I'm going to actually be at HFES, Mm -hmm. uh, which is Human Factors and Ergonomics Society, the annual conference. Um, and, uh... You going to that too? I am not. I'm going to be hanging back. Blake will, Blake will still be here, but, uh... Yeah, there (laughs) we go. So the way we're hoping things will go next week is that I'll be out there and I'll, I'll take some notes on some interesting things that I find and hopefully we can have a conversation about it if everything works out with the technology behind the scenes. If not, uh, you know, you can, you can just look forward to your next regularly scheduled podcast. But again, we that's... We take preparations for you guys. We do. But that's it for today. So if you want to be featured on the show, we're all over social media. Go ahead and comment on our SoundCloud, Facebook, or Twitter. Send us an email like Christina did at humanfactorscast at gmail.com with all of your questions. You can also get to the front of the question line by supporting us on our Patreon site at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Be sure to like, subscribe, and review us on iTunes. Make it good. Mm -hmm. The Google Play Store, SoundCloud, or your favorite podcast directory. We're always trying to keep in touch with interesting topics that you guys, our listeners, want to hear about on the show. So feel free to suggest a way. I want to thank Blake for being on the show again today. Blake, where can our listeners find you? Uh, you can find me on the Twitter at UXChilbro. And thanks for having me again on the podcast, guys. Yeah, mm-hmm. man, you're mm-hmm. welcome mm-hmm. back anytime. We like you here. Oh, yeah, we love having you here. As always, thanks to my co-host, Mr. Billy Hall. Where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter and streaming on YouTube at Comstar Cleric. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome with two O's. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time... It depends. depends.